It was like a beautiful mind. I used to keep a magic marker, wow. uh, not a magic marker, a dry erase marker in my bathroom. So that if I was in the shower and had an idea, as soon as I got out of the shower, I'd write it on the tiles. Super important and one thing most people don't look at. I think mindset is a huge, huge, huge part of actually getting some joy out of a, out of a difficult job. Rise and shine, it's Espresso time. Good morning, Believe Nation. It's Evan. I am not a morning person, but here's what I know. When you start your day with a powerful routine that inspires you, it will change your life, like watching these videos. So let's start your day of right together, grab your coffee, and get ready for a shot of Espresso from Simon Sinek. I wake up every morning. Espresso, keep me going. I wake up. When I wrote Leaders Eat Last, that, that book, I mean, it was a, it was a behemoth. Yeah. And uh, I had, you know, nights and weekends were a fantasy, you know? <laughs> yeah. And it, it was, became an obsession. I mean, it was like a beautiful mind. I used to keep a magic marker, wow. uh, not a magic marker, a dry erase marker in my bathroom. So that if I was in the shower and had an idea, as soon as I got out of the shower, I'd write it on the tiles. And I'd stand there brushing my teeth in the morning or the evening, and I'd read one of the notes that I wrote on the tile and I'd have another idea. And if you walked into my bathroom, the tiles were filled with ideas. I love it. I mean, it was, it was, and I mean, it was really insanity. I mean, it was fun though. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I lost two relationships over the course really? of that book. Yeah, because I was not, I was not myself. I was stressed out. And I was short, and uh, you know, it was. And as soon as the book was done, I'm still friends with with one of my exes, who was the one I was dating, uh, the writing that book. And she, she, like, she only knew me in that period, and she knows me now. And she's like, "This is better." Wow, like, I, know, I, know, I know, you're a nicer human being. It's yeah. not just nicer. I'm just, I'm, I'm less stressed. Yeah. yeah. But would I have changed it? No. Yeah. I, I, those sacrifices. The, it would have been nice for those relationships to 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 have lasted, but but you know the the book, the message is bigger than me. Being an entrepreneur doesn't mean you have to sacrifice your relationships. It doesn't. I think it's a common misperception that to be an entrepreneur you have to only do that one thing. You can't have kids. You can't have a husband or wife. You can't have a relationship. You're going to treat everybody poorly because the only thing, the only thing that matters is the business. The key is creating a relationship that serves you. This is where a lot of people fall apart is you have this goal for a business you want to build and then you have the goal for a relationship you want to build and you see them as two separate things as opposed to, no, all we're doing is try to build an ideal life for ourselves. I think about Nina, who we've been married, I don't know how many years now. I made this graph of my YouTube success from the day that Nina and I got married. And you see, the early days of my chart and having kind of mediocre, just flailing around, trying to figure things out. And then once I married Nina, the growth takes off, explodes, getting massive success on the channel. And it's not because Nina taught me anything about YouTube. She didn't, right? She, she was just supportive, but she didn't have any strategies. YouTube wasn't uh, giving her inside information on how I could win harder. But what she did was she allowed me to live my life. She was super supportive. She gave me encouragement when I needed it. She gave me the time and the space to work on the thing when I needed it. She made me feel happy. I think happiness is massively underlooked at in general by entrepreneurs. When people ask me, how do I still stay so motivated? How do I still stay consist so consistent? How do I stay optimistic? What's the number one tip that I have for your health, like, well, it's happiness. It's doing work that you love. Being around people that you love. Being around people that lift you up. Super important and one thing most people don't look at. And so once I started being with Nina and we married her and the thing takes off, because we built a life. I, I look at, what am I doing right now? I'm on vacation. Uh, I'm, I'm out in British Columbia. We're there's this beautiful spot, there's a local beach here, it's crazy hot, crazy warm, and it's a Tuesday for me, and Tuesday's my YouTube filming day, so I have to make YouTube videos, and that's what I'm doing. So we spent the morning uh, getting you know, new coffee, different coffee shop, we drove an hour outside of town to have the best Japanese food in the province, uh, went to an awesome little beach there, and now came back here, 
Nina's gonna wash Timo, our dog, because he got really dirty in the sand. Hayden's gonna relax for an hour, my son. And I'm outside filming videos. It's part of the lifestyle. I think what you need to ask yourself is, are you just gonna have these moments, these bursts of inspiration, where you just need to shut down and go home and write and, and make and create? And then you wanna just go all in a relationship and the, re the relationship you want is basically, I'm gonna be with you except when I'm not, and when I'm not, I'm all in doing something else. So you have to go a month at a time without me. Is that the relationship you want? Or can you build a little more balanced life? I think the people who go all in on their business end up sometimes creating great things, but also end up not being happy and burning out. How have I made over 10,000 videos on YouTube? How have I not missed an upload day in, I don't know, seven, eight years? Still making content every single day, not getting tired. How, how, why? Because I love not just the work, but I love the life. I work to create the life that I wanna build. And so what you need to start to ask yourself is, what is the life that you want? To not think that, okay, I need to shut down relationships for the next five years while I focus on my business, and instead to say, how do I find the partner? Here's a great question to ask. How do I find the partner who makes me and my business better? It doesn't have to be a business partner and your partner doesn't have to even be involved in the company at all, but has to understand what you're going through, has to be supportive for what you're doing and recognize that that love, support, encouragement actually makes you a better entrepreneur. I believe that being married makes me a better entrepreneur. I believe that being a father makes me a better entrepreneur. Where most people see that as time away, disadvantages, etc., I think that makes me better and the results show for themselves. You look at my stats, you look at the growth, it shows for itself that I have had more success being a husband than not. I've had more success being around my son than not. I've had more success being around mentoring people, right? The, the people that I've invested into as entrepreneurs own a piece of their business and mentor and guide them every day. Logically, it doesn't make sense. If you look at Alex and Jeremy and Drew and Bo, my entire Monday now is gone, gone, air quotes, gone, where I'm not building my business. But since working with them, I've had more increase in my business as well. My business has done better. Spending one less day on the work and mentoring people has grown my company. Why? It's not that the businesses are so connected, it's that I get a greater sense of purpose, I have even more energy, I feel like the work that I do matters, and I'm around supportive people. And the more that you have that in your business, in your life, the more success and happiness you're gonna have, period. So instead of seeing it as moments in time to say, okay, I'm gonna spend a year or two years or five years working on my business and then I'll be ready. You won't be ready, newsflash. You're not gonna be ready because some other, you're a crazy duck. You know that? You're watching this video, you're watching these channels, you're crazy, you're awesome, you wanna create something new, you don't wanna fit in with the crowd, you don't wanna be like everybody else, you want to birth a new world that doesn't exist yet, that's you, you're crazy. So guess what's gonna happen? You may be mentally telling yourself, okay, for the next three years, I'm just gonna buckle down, no relationships, focus on my business, that's it. You know what's gonna happen after three years? You're gonna to wanna to do it again, because you're gonna get another big idea. You get some other thing that you wanna work on. It's, it's a never ending cycle, it will not go away. This is in you for the rest of your life. You're gonna look and see the world differently and look for improvements and look at how you can make things better because that's the way that you think. And so if you only operate by that to say, okay, I'm gonna shut everything else down and only focus on this for the next three years, you're cheating yourself from a real life. You're cheating yourself from a real life, a fulfilled life. Now, what fulfillment and happiness looks like for you can change. It can change from year to year. It can change from month to month. It can change from week to week. And then you can adjust your schedule. Your schedule should always be a reflection of what brings you purpose, happiness, satisfaction, joy, impact. It's reflected in your calendar and your calendar must change to reflect it. But the idea that you have to shut off having a personal life in order to be a successful entrepreneur, I don't subscribe to and the results have been the exact opposite. The key is getting somebody who makes you a better person, who understands what you're going through, who can support you, even if they're not an entrepreneur, but they're willing to support you on your quest, on your journey. 
And I think when you find that person, it makes all the difference. Entrepreneurs typically don't have a fantastic track record with relationships, <laughs> especially with the news recently coming out, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, etc. But it can be good. But it's on you to figure out what does a balanced life look like for you on your terms, and then to find a person who can help you live it. Now I've got a really special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy, but before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week? The science says that when you just watch a video, you get motivated, you get inspired, you have a 35% chance of following through on your goals. 35%, that's not enough, that's not enough just to get motivated. Believe Nation, we're here, you're here. The today matters, you're an action taker. When you commit to a plan of action, of when and how you're gonna follow through. When you write it down, you have a 91% chance of following through. And when you commit publicly to somebody else, it jumps to 95% chance. From 30 something percent to 95% chance of you following through. Believe Nation, we need to make this happen. So question of the day, your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action specific for the next week. Put it down in the comments below and I'm gonna show on screen sometime next week to celebrate. Also, if you want to have more self-confidence and self-belief, the science says it can take up to 254 days of consecutive action for the habit to stick. And that's what I want for you. So I've designed a custom free program where we're going to send you an unlisted video for the next 254 days to shift your confidence and belief forward. The link to join is in the description below. We'll walk into a room and say, here's the problem, here's what I think, but I'm interested in your opinion. Let's go around the room. It's too late. I would rather take the risk of walking out knowing that I might get moved in a way that I've never experienced before more than just go and have a nice night out and see something that I know is good. Successful measurement, successful recognition is not just for the steps you take. It's not just for the effort. It's that the effort you exerted moved us closer to where we're trying to get to. Working at a, at a, at a hard job, working for a bad boss can sometimes be one of the greatest educations ever. So. The question is, can, we, can you change your mindset? Instead of waking up in the morning going, oh, I can't do this again, but rather view it as university. You know, you're getting a master's degree in leadership and you may be learning everything how not to do things. And you, to wake up in the morning and be like, what am I gonna learn today? Early on in my career, I had, a, I had a really bad boss who believed that she could get the most out of us by berating us. And, and she, she told me once that I had one of my reviews and she said, you have no talent. And I was like, nothing and she was like nothing this was her way of i guess motivating me um but i had such a good attitude about it for a couple of reasons one because i knew i knew what i was up against every day and instead of taking it personally i viewed it as as my education of how not to lead and i literally would file this stuff all away and use it someday i get to use it now um and also misery loves company you know, I had fantastic, a fantastic relationship with my team. We looked after each other because we all had this, this oppressive boss. We would compare the advice that we got in our, in our, uh, in our little career building sessions. Um, and, uh, and we took care of each other. And so we had a responsibility to each other. And that's where we cut our teeth on being leaders. And it actually made the job wonderful. Yes, there were days that were oppressive. Yes, there were days that I hated. Yes, there are days I wanted to like pull my hair out and just quit. But it's because of the team that I had and we looked after each other and the mindset of learning every day that I, that I made the most of it. So I, I think mindset is a huge, huge, huge part of actually getting some joy out of, a, out of a difficult job. I realized that what I was experiencing was an unfulfilled career or an unfulfilled life compressed and exaggerated into a 24 hour period because I had an amazing day. I had an incredibly exciting experience. I didn't want to wake up and do it again. I was full of regret. I didn't, I was regretted saying yes to this. I didn't want to be there. I felt totally out of control. And I realized, you know, a lot of people confuse excitement with joy or they confuse um, happiness with fulfillment. You know, our careers and our jobs can be exciting and fun and winning the new client and making a big sale, but that doesn't mean we're fulfilled. That doesn't mean we're inspired. That doesn't mean we have joy in our lives. And I realized this was the mistake I had made. Um, and so I'm in the purpose business, you know, I realized that I felt this way because I didn't have a sense of purpose. And so I tried to invent one. You're here to tell their story and come back. And it worked for like a minute and then it would wear off. 
And I had, I ran out of solutions. I was paranoid. I was scared. I was depressed. I was out of control and I had no solution. And so I lay in that bed and I gave up. I just, I gave up. I had, I had nothing else. And having given up, I decided that if I was going to get stuck here, I might as well make myself useful. And so I was going to volunteer to speak anywhere and as often as they wanted me to, to help out some of the amazing people that I'd met. I don't care if I had to carry heavy boxes or sweep floors. It didn't matter how menial. I wanted to serve those who served others. And upon making that decision, this amazing calm came over me, um, an, a, an excitement even. I was excited to now be there, and I couldn't wait to get to work. There are two um, uh, currencies in the infinite game, will and resources. Um, resources is money, you need money to stay in the game, but you need the will of the people as well. And um, the problem is, is that when we organize to win, that means the score is more important than the inspiration or motivation than people have to to give their blood, sweat, and tears. Um, and when we prioritize resources before will, that's a problem. I've never met a CEO that doesn't believe their people are important. The problem is where on the priority list. You know, you've been to any number of uh, presentations where they put their priorities on the wall, you know, number one, growth, number two, shareholder value, number three, our customer, number four, our employees, there it is. See, I do care about our people. Um, and the reality is, as social animals, we want to work for and we're willing to give our blood, sweat, and tears to leaders who understand that the balance of those two essential uh, currencies, the balance of those two things, is will has to come before resources. And that doesn't mean 90-10. When I talk about putting people before profit, you know, people freak out, which is ridiculous. You need fuel for the car to go. Money is fuel for the organization, of course. Even if there's a leaning, if it's 51-49, there has to be a slight leaning towards people because there will always be decisions that a company has to make in which those two cannot uh, uh, both be supplied and one will have to be sacrificed. The, que the question is, which will you always prioritize? Um, let me give you a hypothetical example to make my point. Two CEOs, the first CEO says, our number one priority is growth. And of course our people are important because if we take care of our people, we will meet and exceed our financial goals. Second CEO says, our number one priority is our people. And if we take care of our people, we will always meet and exceed our financial goals. Which one would you rather work for? I don't want to I mean, it's obvious, right? It's obvious. Um, so this is what it means to prioritize will over resources. It has, of course, of course, uh, money matters, um, but the people matter more. The thinking of Milton Friedman, the, the, the 1970s economist, has really dominated sort of business theory today. He theorized that the responsibility of business, this is his definition, the responsibility of business is to maximize profit within the bounds of the law, right? He, 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 what about ethics? You know, like a, a, a pharmaceutical company that raises the price on essential drug 200%, 300%, 500%, 800%, it's not illegal. It is unethical, right? It makes us uncomfortable, and yet the law is not broken. That's not a good enough standard to run a business. Um, and it was his thinking that gave rise to the, uh, the theory of shareholder supremacy which was a theory proposed in the late 1970s where um, we prioritize the wants, needs, and desires of a shareholder over the needs of the customer or the employee, which is like a coach who's trying to build a great team by doing what the fans want versus what the players need, right? That's basically shareholder supremacy. And as I said, it was just a theory proposed in the late 1970 that was popularized during the boom years of the 80s and 90s. Um, mass layoffs where we use the livelihoods of human beings to meet arbitrary projections on an annualized basis at the end of the year um, did not exist, did not exist as a standard business practice prior to the 1980s, did not exist. It was popularized during, during the 80s and 90s. Um, the dismantling of Glass-Steagall, which was an act passed after the Great Depression to prevent another Great Depression from happening, and by the way, was extremely effective. Between the dismantling of the Glass-Steagall in the 80s and 90s and the Great Depression, there were a total of zero stock market crashes. Since the dismantling, all in the name of corporate profit, we've had three. We had uh, the dot-com boom, Black Monday in 2008. Um, in other words, when we play simply with a finite mindset, we actually do long-term damage to our own system that's supposed to benefit 
uh, all of us. Um, and, 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 and I find that upsetting. Um, we've seen the rise of, 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 of Milton's, uh, of Friedman's thinking, rather. Um, and like I said, his theories dominate business today. And we feel it. Not only have we had those, those stock market crashes, but anybody who goes to work today, there's a general feeling of unease, you know, especially if you work for a company that embraces annual or even quarterly layoffs to meet arbitrary projections. Keep in mind, a lot of the companies that employ uh, mass layoffs are profitable, just not as profitable as they would like. It's not like they're losing money and they had to do this to save the sink sinking ship. That's something completely different. These are highly profitable companies that missed a projection and so they laid people off so they could meet that projection. There's something fundamentally wrong with that. And we know it because we feel it at work. We see this decline of trust. We are not loyal to our companies anymore. Why would we be? They're not loyal to us. And leaders set the tone. So when companies are loyal to us, we will give loyalty back to them. When they're not loyal to us, why would we be loyal to them? I'm tired of, uh, of CEOs telling me that you know, uh, millennials these days don't stick around very long. Well, why would they if you don't offer them any kind of loyalty uh, back? And it's not for the people to prove to you that they're loyal, it's the other way around. Dopamine is the feeling uh, that you found something you're looking for or that you accomplished something you set out to accomplish. So you know that feeling you get when you cross something off your to-do list? That's dopamine. Feels awesome. You know when you, when you have a goal to, to hit and you achieve that goal, you're like, yes! You feel like you've won something, right? That's dopamine. The whole purpose of dopamine is to make sure that we get stuff done, right? Um, the, uh, the historical reason for dopamine, we would never eat if we only waited to get, until we got hungry because there's no guarantee that we would find food. So dopamine exists to help us go looking for food. We get dopamine when we eat, which is one of the reasons we like eating. And so when you see something that reminds you of something that feels good, we wanna do the behavior that helps us get that feeling, right? So let's say you're out there going for a walk and you see an apple tree in the distance. You get a small hit of dopamine. And then what it does is it focuses us on our goals. And now we start walking towards the apple tree. And as the apple tree starts to get a little bigger, we feel like we're making progress, you get another little shot of dopamine, and another little shot of dopamine until you get to the tree and you're like, yes! Okay, this is why we're told you must write down your goals. Your goals must be tangible. There's a, there's a biological reason for that. We, we're very, very visually oriented animals. You have to be able to see the goal for it to biologically stay focused, right? If you don't write down your goals, if you can't see your goals, it's very hard to get motivated, to get inspired. For example, think about corporate visions, right? A corporate vision has to be something we can see, right? That's why it's called a vision. You can see it, right? To be the biggest, most respected, to be the fastest growing are not visions. They're nothing, right? What does that even look like? Respected by whom? Your mother, yourself, your friends, your shareholders? Who knows? What's the metric? Dunno. It's amorphous, doesn't motivate us. Just like I can't tell you, you will get a bonus if you achieve more. You're gonna ask me, how much more? I'm gonna say, more. Doesn't work. You need a tangible goal. You need a tangible goal, right? Here's a great vision. Martin Luther King, I have a dream that one day, little black children and little white children will play on the playground together and hold hands together. We can imagine that. We can set our sights on that. And every time we achieve a goal and achieve a metric and achieve a milestone that makes us feel like we're making progress to the, the vision we can see, we keep going and going and going until we achieve something remarkable. You have to be able to see it. Dopamine. Like I said, dopamine is the feeling you get when you set out to find something you're looking for as well. I talked about the to-do list. I came home from a trip just a couple days ago and I had a bunch of errands to run and I wrote down a little list of things I had to do and off I went, right? And as I was walking past, I think it was the dry cleaners, I don't remember. I was walking past something, I remembered, oh, I have to do that, and I hadn't written it down on my, I hadn't written down on my to-do list. So I went in and I finished what I needed to do, and then when I came out, I then wrote it on my to-do list and then crossed it out. Because <laughs> I wanted the dopamine. Feels good. <laughs> dopamine comes with a warning. Dopamine is highly, highly, highly addictive. Here are some other things that release dopamine. Alcohol, nicotine, gambling, your cell phone, 
Oh, you think I'm joking. Okay, we've all been told that, uh, you know, uh, if you wake up in the morning and you crave a drink, you might be an alcoholic. Well, if you wake up in the morning, the first thing you do is check your phone before you even get out of bed, you might be an addict. If you walk from room to room in your own apartment holding your telephone, <laughs> you might be an addict. When you're driving in your car and you get a text and your phone goes beep, we, we hate email, true, we love the beep, the buzz, the ding, oh. <laughs> right? You'll be there in 10 minutes and yet you have to look at it right now. You might be an addict. And even if you read it and it says, are you free for dinner next Thursday and you have to reply immediately, you can't wait the 10 minutes, you might be an addict. And for all you Gen Ys out there who like to think that you're better at multitasking because you grew up with the technology, then why do you keep crashing your cars when you're texting? <laughs> you're, not, you're not better at multitasking, you're better at getting distracted. In fact, if you look at the statistics, ADD and ADHD have, uh, diagnoses of ADD and ADHD have risen 66% in the past 10 years. Okay, ADD and ADHD is a frontal lobe disorder, right? Are you telling me out of nowhere, 66% of our youth have a frontal lobe problem? Where did that come from? No, it's a misdiagnosis, right? What, what, are, the, what are the symptoms of a dopamine addiction to technology? Distractibility, inability to, uh, to get things done, easily, easily distracted, you know? Shortness of attention, it's all the same thing, so we misdiagnose things. It's this, it's the addictive quality of dopamine. We can also get addicted to performance in our companies when all they do is give us numbers to hit, numbers to hit, numbers to hit, and a bonus you get, and a bonus you get, and a bonus you get. All they're doing is feeding us with dopamine and we can't help ourselves. All we do is want more, more, more. It's no surprise that the banks destroyed the economy because one of the things we know about dopamine addict is they will do anything to get another hit, sometimes at the sacrifice of their own resources and their relationships. Ask any alcoholic, gambling addict, or, or drug addict. Ask, ask them how their relationships are doing and if they've squandered any of their resources. It's an addiction. Dopamine is dangerous if it is unbalanced. It is hugely helpful when in a comfortable and balanced system, but when unbalanced, it's dangerous and it's destructive. You speak to businesses and companies and leadership teams and employees and stuff. Uh, without mentioning names, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but have you gone and talked to a company that's been in trouble and then spoken to their team and then checked in on them after you've spoken to their leadership team and what did that look like? Did you notice a noticeable change? Did they come to you and tell you that this has helped our organization out and our culture is much improved because of it? You mean does my work? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> sure. Here, here's the problem with my stuff. You gotta do it. And I am not, I'm not anybody's like, you know, mom or dad, I, I'm not gonna do it for you. And I have a very laissez-faire approach of it. I once had a, I once had a client, this is a, a bunch of years ago, that said, what guarantee do I have that your stuff will work? To which my answer was, None. Like, I, I'm giving you a tool. You can, it's like a hammer. You can use it broadly or narrowly. You can build a table, you can build a house. It's the same tool. You can use it for marketing, you can use it to completely revitalize your entire culture. And even though I'm gonna sell you the most beautiful hammer, I'm not gonna guarantee the structural integrity of the house, right? It's your business. You wanna ignore all my stuff? Ignore it, I don't care. It's your, and if your business collapses, you know what happens to me? Nothing. Like, I don't mean to be, cold about it, like of course I want the people I work with to do well, but it's not mine, it's theirs. And I take no emotional responsibility for the decisions they make. So yes, there are many people that I've had the pleasure of working with, some who worked for dysfunctional organizations, that went on the hard journey of completely changing the way they lead and completely revitalizing their culture and it has great success. It's not because of me, it's because of them. Right? At the same time, there are many people who came in like, what an amazing speech, and did nothing. You know, thanks, that was great, you know? And I don't, it's, of course it's gonna fail, you know? So I, I think that we, we have too much, especially in the consulting world or the design world, everybody's so paternalistic about it. 
I, I, designers are famous for this, right? They get so personally offended when the client chooses the wrong thing. <laughs> oh, they're such idiots. Don't they know we're trying to help them? <laughs> or who cares? Like, it's their business, right? And that's what you find. I've, I've had that. Instead of arguing with somebody for them to make the right choice, which because we genuinely want to help them, what I have found is if you push the accountability until, because when we argue, we're taking accountability. This is better. This will help you. We're taking responsibility, accountability. But if we say, look, we've been doing this a bunch of years. We know more about design than you do. Um, I'm telling you, for every reason that I can outline for you, why this will help you more. But if you don't want to do it, that's fine. It's your business. Do what you want. The minute you switch the accountability and put it all on them, amazingly, they're much more open to your opinion. <laughs> because now they're responsible. Let me tell you a story. So a friend of mine and I, we went for a run in Central Park. Uh, the Roadrunners organization, uh, on the weekends, they host races. And it's very common at the end of the race, they'll have a sponsor who will give away something, apples or bagels or something. And on this particular day, when we got to the end of the run, there were some free bagels and they had picnic tables set up, and on one side was a group of volunteers, on the table were boxes of bagels, and on the other side was a long line of runners waiting to get their free bagel. So I said to my friend, let's, let's get a bagel. And he looked at me and said, ah, the line's too long. And I said, free bagel. And he said, I don't want to wait in line. And I was like, free bagel. And he says, nah, let's, it's too long. And that's when I realized that there's two ways to see the world. Some people see the thing that they want, and some people see the thing that prevents them from getting the thing that they want. I could only see the bagels. He could only see the line. And so I walked up to the line. I leaned in between two people, put my hand in the box, and pulled out two bagels. And no one got mad at me, because the rule is you can go after whatever you want. You just cannot deny anyone else to go after whatever they want. Now, I had to sacrifice choice. I didn't get to choose which bagel I got. I got whatever I pulled out, but I didn't have to wait in line. So the point is, is you don't have to wait in line. You don't have to do it the way everybody else has done it. You can do it your way. You can break the rules. You just can't get in the way of somebody else getting what they want. That's rule number one. Rule number two. I like this one. In the 18th century, there was something that spread across Europe and eventually made its way to America called puerperal fever, also known as the Black Death of Childbed. Basically what was happening is women were giving birth and they would die within 48 hours after giving birth. This black death of childbirth was the ravage of Europe and it got worse and worse and worse over the course of over a century. In some hospitals, it was as high as 70% of women who gave birth who would die as a result of giving birth. But this was the Renaissance. This was the time of empirical data and science, and we had thrown away things like tradition and mysticism. These were men of science, these were doctors. And these doctors and men of science wanted to study and try and find the reason for this black death of childbed, and so they got to work studying, and they would study the corpses uh, of, the, of the women who had died. And in the morning they would conduct autopsies, and then in the afternoon, they would go and deliver babies and finish their rounds. And it wasn't until somewhere in the mid-1800s that Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes, father of Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, realized that all of these doctors who were conducting autopsies in the morning weren't washing their hands before they delivered babies in the afternoon. And he pointed it out and said, guys, you're the problem. And they ignored him and called him crazy for 30 years. Until finally somebody realized that if they simply washed their hands, it would go away. And that's exactly what happened. 
When they started sterilizing their instruments and washing their hands, the black death of childbed disappeared. My point is, the lesson here is, sometimes you're the problem. We've seen this happen all too recently with our new men of science and empirical uh, studiers and these men of finance who are smarter than the rest of us until the thing collapsed. And they blamed everything else except themselves. And my point is, is take accountability for your actions. You can take all the credit in the world for the things that you do right, as long as you also take responsibility for the things you do wrong. It must be a balanced equation. You don't get it one way and not the other. You get to take credit when you also take accountability. Nelson Mandela is a particularly special case study in the leadership world because he is universally regarded as a great leader. You can take other personalities and depending on the nation you go to, we have different opinions about other personalities, but Nelson Mandela across the world is universally regarded as a great leader. He was actually the son of a tribal chief and he was asked one day, how did you learn to be a great leader? And he responded that he would go with his father to tribal meetings and he remembers two things when his father would meet with other elders. One, they would always sit in a circle. And two, his father was always the last to speak. You will be told your whole life that you need to learn to listen. I would say that you need to learn to be the last to speak. I see it in boardrooms every day of the week. Even people who consider themselves good leaders, who may actually be decent leaders, will walk into a room and say, here's the problem, here's what I think, but I'm interested in your opinion, let's go around the room. It's too late. The skill to hold your opinions to yourself until everyone has spoken does two things. One, it gives everybody else the feeling that they have been heard. It gives everyone else the ability to feel that they have contributed. And two, you get the benefit of hearing what everybody else has to think before you render your opinion. The skill is really to keep your opinions to yourself. If you agree with somebody, don't nod yes. If you disagree with somebody, don't nod no. Simply sit there, take it all in, and the only thing you're allowed to do is ask questions so that you can understand what they mean and why they have the opinion that they have. You must understand from where they are speaking why they have the opinion they have, not just what they are saying. And at the end, you will get your turn. It sounds easy, it's not. Practice being the last to speak. That's what Nelson Mandela did. A lot of people think that um, this concept of why was some sort of academic exercise that I went out and studied it, and I didn't. That's not how it began. Um, as you said, it began out of pain. I own my own small business. It was a strategic marketing consultancy. And superficially, my life looked pretty good. I owned my own business. I made a decent living. We had incredible clients. We did incredible work. Except after a few years of doing that, um, I sort of lost my passion for it. I didn't want to wake up and do it again. And I was actually very embarrassed by that um, because there were people who had real problems like poor me, you know? And so I kept it to myself. And I pretended, all of my energy went into pretending that I was more successful, happier, and more in control than I felt. Um, and it wasn't until uh, a friend of mine came to me and sort of expressed concern, like, you're different, Every is everything okay? And it wasn't until I had sort of that safety net uh, of, of someone close by that I had the courage to sort of not only face the problem, but but really confront it. Um, and and it was that, that, that was the birth of this concept of why. There was a confluence of events. And I realized that every single organization, including, including my own career, functioned on three levels. What? I did, how I did it, and why I did it. I knew what I did. That was easy to explain. How I did it was also pretty good. I was good at explaining what made me different or special than others, but I couldn't tell you why I was doing it. And it was that, um, that missing piece that I became obsessed with. And once I found my why, not only was my passion restored to levels that I'd never experienced before, but it put me on a trajectory that I couldn't have been on without it. Um, and I learned a lot of things from that experience, a lot. Discovering your why is just the beginning. In order to enjoy all the benefits of having a clearly articulated why, you'll need to have the courage and discipline to use it. Like Thomas Edison said, 
Vision without execution is hallucination. There is an ideal order for implementing your why, though sometimes reality does get in the way, and it all starts with you. Our natural tendency is to start with the tangible. We define our value by what we do, so it takes practice to start with why. Like riding a bicycle, at first we're unsure, unsteady. We're in our heads thinking about all the things we need to do, pedal fast, keep enough speed so we don't fall over. We have to really concentrate. We may even fall over, even scrape our knees, but we get back on the bike and try again, and eventually it becomes natural. Starting with why is no different. At first, it feels awkward. It may not even work, but with practice, it will become so natural that you won't even be able to imagine a time when you couldn't do it, just like riding a bicycle. In time, your why will act as a filter for many of the decisions and choices you make. It becomes a tool to help you find a job or seize an opportunity in which you're more likely to succeed. It removes a lot of the guessing. Here's a metaphor to show you what I mean. It's called the celery test. We're constantly asking people for their advice on what to do or how to do it. It's like going to a dinner party and somebody says, do you know what you need? You need M&Ms. We've done so well with M&Ms, you've got to use M&Ms. Somebody else says to us, rice milk. In this economy, you have to use rice milk. Someone else says to us, Kit Kats. You have to use Kit Kats. And somebody else says to you, it's all about celery. We go to the supermarket with all this good advice from all these smart people with brilliant case studies, and we buy everything. We buy Kit Kats and M&Ms, celery and rice milk. There's a lot of time we spend at the supermarket and a lot of money we spend at the supermarket. And when we get to the checkout lane, we're standing there with all these products in our hands and no one can see what we believe because we bought everything. But let's imagine we know our why. Let's imagine our why is to always be healthy and only do things that protect the health of our bodies. Now, which products do we buy? Given all the same advice from all the same smart people, this time we only buy celery and we only buy rice milk. They're the only two that make sense. We spend less time and less money at the supermarket. And when we're standing there in line with only celery and only rice milk, now people can see what we believe. Somebody walking past can say, hey, I can see that you're healthy, so am I. You just attracted an opportunity or a referral or a friend simply by saying and doing the things that you believe. And the best part is it's scalable. As soon as I said the why, you knew exactly which products we were going to buy. This means the more you can articulate your why, the more others will know what you stand for and will be able to help you make the right decisions. From now on, you will work to ensure everything you do is a good fit. If you do too many things that aren't a good fit, you'll feel uncomfortable and people will feel that you're being inauthentic. On the other hand, when you start with why, your ability to stand out, find support, and work to all your natural strengths will flourish. With practice, you will learn to trust your why. You will eventually start to see your job and the things you do as ways to breathe life into your cause. And the better you get at it, the more you will feel that your life and everything you do has purpose. The best way to implement your why is to work at it slowly. You don't have to do all the tips we suggest. What is important is that you pick up to three and commit to practicing and using them now. I did a little experiment with, um, um, with a homeless person. Not like on them, it's not like electrodes. <laughs> <laughs> with them, voluntarily um, helped me. Um, because the whole idea of giving, right? You ever, you ever, you've, we, you've all walked down the street and you've all seen someone begging and you either have or haven't thrown a few pennies in their cup. When you do, you feel good. You bought that feeling. That is a legitimate commercial transaction. You know, commercial transactions are defined as the exchange of consideration. There was an exchange of consideration here. You gave money, you got the feeling of goodwill. You paid for that feeling. If you didn't give money, you either feel nothing or you feel bad. You can't feel good by not giving. All right, you paid for that feeling. So now the question is, how is that person encouraging us to give? The joke is, they act like every corporation in the world. They talk about themselves. Me, 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 right? Like they sit there with their little outdoor advertising, little sign, right? And it says, I'm homeless, 
I'm hungry, I got 12 kids, I'm a veteran, God bless. They got it all in there, trying to appeal to somebody, the religious vote, the veteran vote, you know, the child sympathizer, surround yourself with lots of pets, go for that one too, right? <laughs> all in an attempt to get something from someone. Takers, not givers, right? All about me. Well, what do, what do corporations do? We've added more RAM, we've added more ROM, we've added more speed. This one's number one. We're the biggest, we're the best. We've been around since 1969. We're better than them, we're faster than them. We're more efficient than that one. Me, 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 me. And so even if we buy their product, guess what? Eh, we don't really feel much. So I did this little experiment. I found um, um, a nice homeless lady on the uh, streets of New York who's willing to help out. And I learned that with her sign, which was pretty typical, I'm homeless, I'm hungry, blah, blah, blah. She makes between $20 and $30 a day uh, for, you know, for a day's worth of work, eight to 10 hours of sitting there selling goodwill. Eight to 10 hours, she'll make $20 to $30. $30 is considered a good day. I changed her sign, and the new sign made her $40 in two hours. And then she left. <laughs> It's one of the reasons she's homeless is because she's decided that she only needs 20 to $30 a day to live. If she stayed, she would have made $150. The point is she made 40 bucks in two hours. What did the sign say? The sign said, if you only give once a month, please think of me next time. It has nothing to do with the taker. It has everything to do with the giver. And what are the objections people give when they don't give? I can't give to everyone. How do I know that they really need it? And so I address both those concerns. I know you can't give to everyone, so if you only give once a month, my cause is legitimate. I will still be here when you're ready to give. 40 bucks, two hours. Make it about them, not about you. The fact of the matter is 100% of customers are people. And 100% of clients are people. And 100% of employees are people. I don't care how good your product is, I don't care how good your marketing is, I don't care how good your design is. If you don't understand people, you don't understand business. We are social animals, we are human beings, and our survival depends on our ability to form trusting relationships. Do you ever watch um, uh, Deadliest Catch on the Discovery Channel? I was flipping through the channels one night and Deadliest Catch came on. And on this episode, just random, um, they were in a huge storm. Now, for those of you who don't know Deadliest Catch, uh, they take these crab fishing boats out in the Bering Sea, which is like terrible, and they put cameras on them, and we watch, right? <laughs> the reason that's, I guess, significant is because these crab fishermen have, I think, one of the top five deadliest jobs in the world. You know, I don't know what the exact number is, but dozens of fishermen die every year doing, doing this. We apparently find that entertaining. Um, which it actually is. Uh, so they have cameras only on five or six of the ships, even though there are many, many, many ships that go out fishing every season. And they don't really come into proximity with each other because you know, the, the ocean's huge. And they usually sabotage each other and give each other false information because they're all competitors. They're all looking to get the crabs and you know, make sure that they find them and somebody else doesn't. And you know, it's business, right? It's just business. It's OK. We all do the same thing in our own companies. And in this one episode, this big, huge storm was so violent that they had to bring all the pots, which are the big cages that they catch the crabs in. They had to bring all the pots back on the boat uh, and wait out the storm. And just by dumb luck, one of the boats that had cameras on it was in proximity of a boat that didn't have cameras on it. And so they filmed. They had secured all their pots on the deck, and so they started filming the other boat. And they filmed a guy climbing on the outside of the cage, securing the pots. And all of a sudden, a huge wave hits the side of the boat, and the guy's not there anymore. And the people on the boat with the cameras start screaming, man overboard, man overboard, man overboard. And they turn their boat towards where they think he might be. He's a stranger, they don't know him, they don't know the, the crew members of the other boat, and yet they react and they turn towards him. And they find him in the drink. And for those of you who don't understand how dangerous this is, if the water is so cold that if you're in the water for, I think that it's a minute or a minute 30, hypothermia will set in and you die. And they come upon him and he's screaming, don't let me die, don't let me die. And they pull him on board, not out of the woods yet, 
They strip off his clothes because it's wet and cold, and they wrap blankets around him to prevent hyperthermia from setting in. And he survives. And it's overwhelming. And the captain comes down, and this is all on, I mean, you can go watch it on TV. You, the camera comes, the captain comes down, and he hugs this stranger, this young man, his competitor. He hugs this guy as if he's his own son. I lost it. Everybody is crying. And you realize what happened here was a human interaction. And the reason they risk their own lives to help this other person, even though they spend every other day trying to get ahead and sabotage, is because at the end of the day, they're all crab fishermen. And they know something about each other. And they know something about the risk that they all take to do this. And when push comes to shove, they will put themselves out there to help each other for no other reason than they get it. They're one of the same. I will promise you that every single member of that crew that day went home with a feeling of fulfillment. I promise you that every single person on that crew that day felt more good in their hearts and in their jobs than the richest days that they've ever pulled in. My question is, is what are you doing to help the person next to you? Don't you want to wake up and go to work for the only reason that you can do something good for someone else? Wouldn't you want them to do that for you? I think the difference between an entrepreneur who, who, who cannot achieve scale, which is different from success, you can make a ton of money, but that's not scale, it's mm -hmm. just money, right? Versus being able to cross that little chasm and find that tipping point where it can really gain scale is the ability to let go. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'd been chief cook and bottle washer. I had done every job. Mm -hmm. And so when I started needing help because I could no longer do every job, I didn't have the time or the energy, um, I wanted to tell everybody how I used to do it and have them do it mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's about like assigning tasks. That's not assigning responsibility. That's not letting go. Mm. And it was a slow, uncomfortable process. Mm -hmm. It's not like... Tomorrow morning, I'm just going to let go. You know, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't work that <laughs> right. way. It's a very uncomfortable process. I assume you you use the analogy of this is your baby. I assume it's something like when your kids grow up and leave the house, or when they become old enough to drive and they gain some mm. independence. Like we'd like to tell them what to do, what to eat, when to go to bed, when to have a shower, but you kind of lose that. And right. some parents struggle with that, and it creates tension in the relationship with their kids. And some parents slowly embrace that their kids are adults and. And it's the same kind of transition where you, people come on and you realize that they care and that they're smart and that they're good at what they do and that they want to learn and so they want to do things they've never done before also. They don't have to be experts in everything. And you let go a little bit and they do an amazing job and you let go an a little bit and, they, and then they, you let go a little bit and they screw it all up and you say, okay, try again. And the more they feel that you care about their success, the more I started to feel um, that I cared about the success of those around me. Um, it became very easy for me to simply say, just take care of this, and whatever happens is fine, and every decision you make, I love. Every decision we make in our lives, as individuals or as organizations, is a piece of communication. It's our way of saying something about who we are and what we believe. This is why authenticity matters. This is why you have to say and do the things you actually believe, because the things you say and do are symbols of who you are. And we look for those symbols so we can find people who believe what we believe. Our very survival depends on it. So if you're putting out false symbols, you will attract people to those symbols, but you won't be able to form trust with them. This is what Tiger Woods did to us. He lied. He lied. He told us what he thought we wanted to hear. And it was great, and we were drawn to it. And all of us who kind of liked that idea of the sort of the good guy, were drawn to it, until we found out it was a lie. He could have been the bad boy of golf. He could have had all the same endorsements and had a fantastic career and still been hailed as one of the great athletes of our day. But he didn't, he chose to lie. Good luck forming trust again, Tiger. We don't believe you. We don't trust you. The goal of putting something out there, if you say what you believe and you do what you believe, you will attract people who believe what you believe. If you go to one of your friends and you say to one of your friends, how would you like me to dress 
so that you'll like me better? How would you want me to address you? How do you want me to speak so that you'll like me more? Right? Your friends are going to look at you and be like, what are you talking about? Like, come on, come on, come on. What should I wear so that you'll find me more appealing? And how would you like me to speak to you so that you'll like me more? And your friends are going to tell you, just be yourself. That's why I like you. I don't just be yourself. Now think about what we do in industry. What do we do? We do market research, and we go out and we ask the customers, what kind of things, the way we, what style should we speak to you? How should we decorate ourselves? What kind of things are you drawn to so that we can do those things so you'll like us more? It's just as ridiculous. It's just as ridiculous. Organizations should say and do the things they actually believe, and they will attract people who believe what they believe. Or they can choose to lie, and at the slightest hint that they might be lying, cynicism sets in. And people start saying, I'm not sure I can trust these guys because there's not a lot of consistency in all the things they say and do, which means they can't have a very strong belief set or they're lying to me. And we call them inauthentic. The entire process of asking other people who we should be is inauthentic. That's hilarious to me. All these positioning studies we do are inherently, we're gonna do a study to find out from people so we can be more authentic. That's hilarious. <laughs> Say and do what you actually believe and the symbols you put out there, the things you say and the things you do, those red hats are ways that people can find you. What you have the ability to do as designers is create those symbols and allow people to use those things to say something about who they are. Work for companies, work for clients, work for people who you believe what they believe. Show up and feel a part of something bigger than yourself. And your part is to put what they believe into pictures and words and symbols and graphics so that other people can use those things to say something about who they are. People put Harley Davidson logos on their body to say something about who they are. Corporate logo. Ain't no Procter and Gamble's tattooed on anybody's arm. <laughs> because Harley means something. They stand for something. People put that tattoo on there not to tell you that they own a motorcycle. They put that tattoo there to tell you something about themselves. You ever see anybody with a, with a Mac laptop put a sticker over that beautiful shining apple? Ain't never gonna happen. <laughs> then how will you know who I am? Do you ever see anybody with a PC break out the Windex to clean out their computer? Mac people? <sighs> <laughs> Have you ever seen a dirty Mac? Doesn't exist. Does not exist, why? Because it's who I am. These are symbols we use, the companies that are crystal clear in what they believe and they're disciplined in how they do it, and they're consistent in what they do, and everything they say and everything they do serves as a symbol of the set of values and beliefs. We use those symbols to say something about who we are. We surround ourselves with the people and the products and the brands that say something about who we are. And when we can find the people who believe what we believe, we're weirdly drawn to them because our very survival depends on it. We need it. And so the more you can give of yourself, the more you can give of what you believe, the more you can discipline, with discipline, say and, and do the things you actually believe, strange things start to happen. So I'll tell you another story. It's a personal story. It's not one that I share very often. And it profoundly changed the course of my life. In August of 2011, I had the opportunity to visit Afghanistan with the United States Air Force. I had done some work with the mobility forces. These are the people that fly the tankers and the cargo planes and Air Force One, all the big planes. And the general said to me, Simon, you've gotten to know us quite well. It would mean a lot to me if you would go to either Iraq or Afghanistan to see our men and women perform their mission. Would you be willing to go? So I said, yes. They picked Afghanistan. Now, I didn't tell my parents where I was going because I didn't want them to worry. I told them I was going away with the Air Force, true. I told them I was going to be out of touch for a while because I was gonna be on a lot of planes, true. I told them I was going to Germany, true. I just didn't tell them from Germany I was going to Afghanistan. <laughs> and I had no responsibility, I was simply going as an observer. I had two officers who were assigned to be my escorts, and we met basically for the first time uh, at Penn Station in Philadelphia, where we drove to Dover Air Force Base, where we would leave 
for Germany. We took a big C5 cargo plane. In Germany, we changed planes and we got on a KC-135 tanker built in 1956. I was on a plane built in 1956 <laughs> um, where we flew to Bagram. We landed in the middle of the night. We touched down and the big door on the side of the plane had opened but we hadn't gotten off the plane yet. We'd been on the, we'd been on the ground for maybe 10 minutes and the base came under rocket attack. Three rockets hit 100 yards off our nose. This is how my trip began. Now, if you've ever been in a war zone, for those of you in the room who've ever been in a war zone, you, have, you know this. You have all the feelings you're supposed to have, you just don't have them at the right times. Weirdly, I was incredibly relaxed, and maybe that's because the people I was with were incredibly relaxed and I felt safe. We're eventually, the panic came later. We're eventually given the all clear, and we went to our housing. Now, the purpose of being in Afghanistan, we were gonna be in the country for up to 30 hours, and the goal was to witness an airdrop mission. They're not regularly scheduled, so we had to find out if there was one as soon as we got there, and it turns out there was one first thing in the morning. So we got about two and a half hours, three hours of sleep, and we went and got on this airdrop mission, which was incredible. We sat in the back of a C-17, we flew about an hour and a half, two hours out to the middle of nowhere, Afghanistan. The plane dropped down to about 2,000 feet, the back door opened and we sat there and watched as cargo flew out the back so we could resupply an army forward operating base. It was an amazing, amazing experience. We then flew back to Bagram and the goal was to come back home. There's no regularly scheduled flight so we have to sort of find out what flights we can get on and it's always up to the discretion of the pilots. We found a flight that was leaving um, shortly after we got back and so we uh, asked the pilots and they said, absolutely, we can join their flight. And we waited and waited and waited and waited and waited and waited. And eventually we got on the plane, we were all strapped in, literally five minutes from leaving, and the pilot walked up to us and said, I'm sorry, we need to bump you guys. We need to make more room for stretchers. It was carrying wounded warriors out of, out of theater and they needed our space. If there's ever a good reason to get bumped off a plane, this was it. So we got off the plane and we went to look for another flight. And that's when we found out there were no other flights until Tuesday, and this was only Saturday. I was gonna get stuck in Afghanistan for at least four days, maybe longer, because we don't know what we're gonna get on on Tuesday, and I have no way of telling my parents. They're not gonna hear from me on the date that I told them that I would get home. Immediately, every fiber of my being sank. And I remember becoming completely panicked and completely preoccupied with one thing, my happiness, my safety, and my comfort. And I didn't care who had to go out of their way to get me what I wanted. I remember there was a public affairs officer who said, I can get you to Kyrgyzstan, but you don't have the right visa. And I looked at him and I said, you get me on that plane. I don't talk to people like that. And I could see myself becoming this person that I hated. Some of us in the room have worked for somebody in our careers who wants the next promotion, and they don't care that they have to tie our, turn our lives upside down so they can get what they want. I was becoming that person. We went back to our housing, and I lay down on the bed and closed my eyes. My mind was racing. I was convinced that there would be another rocket attack on the base. I was convinced that I was gonna get hit. I was convinced that my parents were gonna find out that I was in Afghanistan when an, arm, uh, an Air Force officer knocks on the door. I was convinced. Paranoia, fear, everything that you can imagine swept over me. One of the officers that I was traveling with said, I'm gonna see if I can get us on another flight, and he left the room. The other officer, thinking I was asleep just because my eyes were closed, said, well, I'm gonna to go to the gym then, and he walked out and turned off the lights for me. I couldn't sleep, my mind was racing. All I wanted to do was get out of there. I regretted saying yes, I regretted being there, I didn't wanna be there. I'm in the purpose business. I write and talk about this sense of why and sense of purpose in our lives. So I started to remind myself, Simon, you need a purpose. You don't have a purpose, you need a purpose. So I started inventing one. You're here to tell their story. It worked for like a few minutes and then it would slide back into my fear and panic again. And I realized what was happening to me is I was living the equivalent of an unfulfilled life compressed into 24 hours. I had an amazing day. I got to see something that most people will never get to see in their entire lives, except I didn't wanna wake up and do it again the next day. And I think many of us do the same thing. 
We, com we confuse moments of happiness with joy and fulfillment. We confuse winning a piece of business, getting a promotion, getting an award, getting recognition, doing well on a test with actual deep fulfillment. Those experiences are wonderful, but happiness is fleeting. There's not a single person in this room, absolutely zero, who's walking around with an amazing sense of accomplishment for that test that you aced a year ago. <laughs> that feeling is gone. Fulfillment is something entirely different. It's something you carry with you on a daily basis, whether you're enjoying the day or not. It's like loving your family. You may not like your family every day, but you love your family every day. One is fleeting, the other is lasting. And this is what was happening to me. I'd realized that I had this amazing day and I was confusing happiness and fulfillment. And so I gave up, I lay in that bed paranoid, scared, and depressed, and I literally gave up. I decided that if I was gonna get stuck here, I might as well make myself useful. And so I decided I was gonna volunteer. I would speak anywhere they wanted me to speak. I would carry boxes and sweep floors. All I wanted to do was serve some of those amazing people that I'd met on this trip. I wanted to serve those who served others. And instantly, this incredible calm came over me. I was even excited. This is what fulfillment means. It's not the fleeting joys that we may experience. It's not the accomplishments that we achieve. It's the opportunity to serve those who serve others. And upon making this realization, I had nothing but joy and calm and excitement and peace. It was like a movie, the timing was uncanny. Upon making this amazing realization, the door flung open and it was Major Throckmorton. He said, I got us on a flight. There's been a flight that's been redirected, but we have to go now. We have to go now. If we don't leave now, they're going to leave without us. Where's Matt? I said, he's at the gym. So we ran to the gym. We got him off the treadmill. We ran back. No time to shower. He put his uniform back on. We grabbed all our stuff, and we ran out to the flight line. When we got out to the flight line, we could see the plane we were going to go. We were going to take home. See Big C-17, it was sitting right out there on the tarmac. And as soon as we got there, a security cordon came down and they wouldn't let us out to the plane. Because somewhere else on base, they were having a fallen soldier ceremony. And out of respect, when they have the fallen soldier ceremony, everything stops. And so, so we, we sat on the curb and waited. And I told the guys what I had gone through in the bed just moments ago. And I cried like a baby. And this is one of the things a lot of people don't realize about the military. Crying is just fine. Those guys kept me safe, not just physically, they made me feel safe. And I felt totally comfortable telling them what I was going through and how I felt. Eventually the security cordon came up and they led us out to the plane. We would be the only three passengers aboard this plane other than the crew. What I didn't tell you is the reason the flight was redirected is because we would be carrying home the fallen soldier for whom they just had the ceremony. The army brought the flag draped casket on board. All the Air Force crew stood in a line at perfect attention. I'm a civilian, I put my hand on my heart. I felt kind of stupid. So I stood at attention with the Air Force crew as the army laid the casket in the middle of the aircraft. They all did a very slow eight count salute They marched off the plane, and we watched them hugging and crying as they walked away. The crew got to work strapping this precious cargo down. We then had a nine and a half hour overnight flight back to Germany, where I slept right next to this casket. On every other plane I went on, we talked, we joked. Barely a word was spoke, spoken in nearly 10 hours. On every other flight, I visited the cockpit and hung out with the crew. I didn't visit the cockpit once. And I will tell you, it was one of the greatest honors of my life. Having just gone through this incredibly strange experience on the ground, I had the honor of bringing home somebody who understands service much deeper than I will ever understand it. Serve those who serve others, and you will live a life of joy and fulfillment. If you want another amazing Simon Sinek clip, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. And upon making that decision, this amazing calm came over me. Um, 
an, a, an excitement even. I was excited to now be there. If you're not happy, it's because you're not serving.